in, in public. Um, I mean, we have a couple of other previous papers, but I'm presenting some brand new results today that we're uh, preparing for publication, so I'll be really interested in questions and feedback on that. Um, so typically, we've done stuff with, you know, who do they agree or disagree with and what somebody's stance. But what we've been working on for over a year now is trying to figure out what exactly the disagreements are about. What kinds of particular arguments are people making in support of their uh, position? And also, how do the arguments change over time? So you might see if you looked at, say, 20 years of discussions on gay marriage, you'd notice there's been some kind of tipping point in the last, just really like three years, where all of a sudden, you know, one kind of argument for gay marriage kind of became very popular and there was a whole tip, you know, where like now the Supreme Court has said that, you know, everybody has, has the rights to, to get married. And so our long-term goal would be to be able to track these different kinds of arguments that are people are making for and against an issue over time and see how they change when new arguments or new themes come in. And then this other thing, which I, as I said, is false advertising. I'm not going to actually talk very much about sarcasm, but what's really interesting to me is that this language is really, really social. So about 10% of the utterances in our corpus are sarcastic, and they provide a lot of challenges for sentiment analysis. And at least 20% of it is very highly emotional. So if we have people rate arguments on a scale of uh, from negative 5 is very emotional to plus 5 is highly factual. <laughs> We have, at the, at the tails of that distribution, we have really big chunks of stuff, and then there's a lot of stuff in the middle that's kind of mixed. So, so there's this very emotional argumentation, and you might think, you know, what you want to do is just kind of get it out of there, like if you're trying to say, analyze what people are saying, but it's actually some of the most interesting part of the data, and it's what causes people to vote in a particular way and to hold certain kinds of beliefs. So I don't think you want to just have the assumption, like, let's get rid of all that emotion, and let's just look at the, you know, at the logical argumentation. Okay, so I'm hoping may I, somehow to talk a little bit about the, the the way we're kind of curating this data and building it up, we have uh, we have data, we have hundreds and thousands of discussions that represent millions of posts on almost any topic that a human could think of. Um, we have this initial corpus release that we made three years ago called the Internet Argument Corpus, and we have a new release of that that we're going to release in the spring, which is. IAC 2.0, and that includes uh, a whole lot of more scraped data uh, from Create Debate, from Twitter, and from Reddit. And in the meantime, instead of just um, <coughs> distributing JSON files, which is what we had before, we've structured this into a, an SQL database, and we have an underlying schema across all these different social media sites, <laughs> so that for some queries where the tables are supported by the affordances of the site, you can, you can pull in data from, from lots of different um, social media sites and, and use that in your analysis of the same kind. So you can do cross-domain analyses. You can see like what the difference is in the way that sarcasm is expressed on Reddit versus the way it's expressed in um, online forums or the way it's expressed on Twitter, for example. What is IAC? That's our name for our data, Internet Argument Corpus. Okay, and what's CD? Create Debate. Okay. And um, so here's, you know, most of these sites are kind of like this. You have a, a person who wants to argue about something, and they, they, they post a topic like that, you know, with a position abortion is legal and should stay legal. And then people kind of weigh in and on, the, on the conversation. And a lot of times, sometimes the sites are very unstructured. You just get a thread structure. And, and there's no kind of more formal structure to the conversation. A lot of the sites have uh, set up a pro and con side, and so people, when they post, they self-side for stance, right? So the data, the, some of the data comes kind of self-annotated for stance. I'll show you a, an example in a minute. But what we do is that we take this data from all these different sites and we integrate it um, by, by topic, right? And this is a thing that we're still doing, that we do by hand. In fact, I'm the one who does it. Um, usually not any of my students. 
Um, so, you know, they could go off busy running Weka, and I'll just, like, in my copious spare time, I, I kind of pull up stuff from the data and figure out whether it fits in this topic and how to stance cite it. So, the thing is, you get lots of different discussions that are framed in slightly different ways, and some of the same things come up over and over and over again in social media across all these different sites, like the death penalty. So they get framed in a different way, like is the death penalty morally correct, is it supposed to be in the United States, or just something simply like capital punishment or death penalty injustice. And as you can see from the you know, color coding there, if you want to put those, combine those into a database where you can label them as being either for death penalty or against death penalty, you have to decide which of these statements on either side goes to which way. So that's something that we're doing by hand, which maybe in the future we could do automatically, but at the moment we're, we're curating that data by hand. And you, so you get those topic labels and the stance labels when you download our data. Aren't the case of nuance, it's not either pro or con, but somewhere in the middle, a little bit people, of people. Well, see, these, it's, it's easy to do for these sites where they force people to post on either side because you can just kind of assume that they self-cited for stance, but there is noise in there, for sure. And then if you, we have done analyses where we've looked at, we've tried to find posts where people stake out a middle position, and those are relatively rare. So I think that people that are undecided or that actually have a middle position actually are not posting. So what you get in the postings are you get kind of people that are really in, entrenched most of the time on one side of the thing. But you do get you do get some stuff in the middle and we have been able to find stuff in the middle. And we've tried to model we tried to model, you know, like how to get yes? Have you looked at people who've crossed over who started adamant one? This is what like my colleague Pranav Anand, when we first started this project whenever it was five years ago, he spent months looking at different sites trying to find what kind of uh, topics people would actually change their mind. <laughs> and um, and we, we, I just finally at one point I said, well, we have to spend $200,000 in the next four months, and so I'm starting to scrape. So, you know, I said, whatever, you know, we just have to, you know, maybe it's not the perfect data, maybe we can find data. But we do have in the Reddit data now, we have that change my view Reddit, where people say, like, whether an argument actually changed their view, and that's, so that's, something, but, but often what you see, you, you do see these nuanced positions, and we think if we do the argument analysis where we start to identify what the reasons are for somebody's stance, we might be able to more easily identify those middle positions. Like you might say, um, I believe conception begins at birth, um, but I still believe in a woman's right to choose. And usually people that hold those two beliefs are are on opposite sides of an issue, but there's some people that kind of, um, what did I say, conception? No, I, life begins at conception. Life begins at conception, but I believe in a woman's right to choose. So usually if you believe that life begins at conception, you don't believe in abortion, right? So that there's, there, there are some positions like that that we've actually been able to, to find. And we're interested in finding those partly kind of to to be able to reuse the data possibly for educational purposes. So I, I'm going to get way off my topic here. But, but there's evidence that shows that the more um, sides of an issue people are exposed to, the more holistic their view is and the less likely they're to, they are to be entrenched on a, on a, in a particular position. So, so we have some kind of long-term goal of being able to kind of reuse some of these arguments once we can identify them in some kind of educational context. Okay, so is that all, that's all clear. Okay, so I, I think I already said most of this, why it's interesting, there's lots of applications. I'm, I just love this data, all the data that we can get. Um, it has many unique properties, it's very social, it's very dialogic, there's lots of open research uh, problems, and we've got uh, an NSF medium that still has another couple years to run, and we're, you know, we're just, curating this data, we're adding more stuff to it, doing more work with it all the time. And there's some of our papers. Um, so first I'm going to talk about stance classification um, a little bit. I suppose I should, I don't know, I'm not, I can't see a clock anywhere. Half done? Half done? Yeah. Okay, all right. So stance classification is the issue of taking um, somebody's 
posts or somebody's set of posts, you know, on, a, on an argument and figuring out what side of an issue that they're, that they're on. And there's been a, a fair amount of work in this area, although, you know, the very first work in this area, you know, it's like 2003, there's been a fair amount of work since then, but not work exactly on data like, like ours. Um, a lot of the stuff that's been done have been done on the U.S. congressional debates, um, but there, a lot of the data is not as dialogic as our data, it's not social, yes? So, you have said, why is it interesting? So, I certainly agree it's interesting, but why is it important? What impact will it have on the world to do this? Well, I think there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of, di first of all, there's just natural language processing techniques that can work on social data. So there's kind of an underlying technology thing. And any kind of s social media data will need some of those language processing techniques. We have long-term broader impacts. We think it could be used for educational purposes. It also could be used for digital democracy, like you could mine the data that's out there and say, like, what are people saying about this issue? What are people in a particular region saying about this issue? How do people's stances differ across geographic areas? There's a lot of different kinds of things that you could do with the, with the data. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you for asking. All right, so on Convince Me, as I said, you know, it's set up like this, you know, that the stance is um, self-labeled. So somebody will post a topic like death penalty justice, and then they'll, they, they set up the conversation with two sides like this, you know. They should be put to death, yes, an eye for an eye, or they should have life in prison, right? And then people post, you know, on each side, and then you do get these kind of vote ups, you know, that that was convincing to me, um, and you can vote, you know, vote for either side and stuff like that. We've we've done some work modeling some of this, and it's when it's not clear that the convincingness or the efficacy of an argument is actually related to the up votes. I mean, the, I can't remember the exact number, but the, it's like the R squared is like 0.11. You know, it's, it's not very, it's not very um, predictive of, of it. So in all that convinced me, we have, we have all these uh, different topics. Like I said, we have these kind of curated topics. So we, we have a massive amount of data that's not topic labeled, and then we have the data that's topic labeled and stance cited that's kind of within there, and I kind of continually do that and we have topics that we consider to be kind of playful like Star Wars versus Lord of the Rings and technical like Firefox versus IE or Mac versus PC and then we have these um, <clears throat> we have these what we call ideological topics like abortion climate change death penalty evolution and you see di you see quite a lot of differences um, first of all these topics tend to be across all kinds of different sites and be still discussed, you know, like over time. So what, you know, we would scrape stuff four years ago and a lot of the same arguments would still be made, you know, be made now. And these, these dialogues are also more deeply embedded. People are more emotional. So if you just look at some kind of statistic like average post per person, these, these ideological ones have a lot more. Um, Usually, like if you're going to say, you know, cats rule and dogs drool, you might just say that, you know, and you don't need to elaborate on it too much, right? So, so people in those, they're not as heavily invested. They don't kind of get so much into an argument, and hence the conversations are not so deeply embedded. And across these different um, topics, you know, if you just take the majority class, you'll see some of them are skewed. But many of them, you know, they're around 50-50. So you get about half the people posting on one side and half on the other. Yes? Did you have another question? You don't post an anti-evolution I mean, I would think those folks would uh, Half and half. Well, really? 50, wow. yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, uh, so that's one of the points I want to make, actually, is if you just go to curated argument, like if you go to a site that's like an official debate site where somebody scientific has curated the ar an argument, there's a whole lot of arguments here that you would never ever see on a site like that, right? Because they're not considered to be rational or something. Yeah, Ron, was your, was your point that those people don't exist or that they wouldn't make those arguments in public? Well, they wouldn't make the arguments in public because oh. they wouldn't have arguments, they'd just say, because there aren't it's, it's, it's evidence They're not that smart, though. <laughs> They're not that smart. They're not that smart. I, I have one example in my, I have one example in my sarcasm stuff. If I get to the end, you'll get to see a sarcastic uh, evolution, anti-evolution post. 
So, so anyway, um, so the first thing that we did with this data was that the other work that had been done before us on <coughs> stance had never said like, a lot of it had treated it not as dialogic, they just take the post out of the blue and then they'd done, you know, kind of text classification on it. And nobody had ever established what the human talk line was for that kind of situation where you just show somebody a text, a, a post out of a dialogue, out of the blue, and you say, and you say, this is the issue that's being discussed. These are the sides. Which side is this post on? Right. So nobody. We were kind of surprised. We were surprised that nobody had done it, and we were also surprised that the numbers, the the accuracy that people were getting who were working on this problem, that they were so bad. We're like looking at the data and we're thinking, why is this so bad? Why is it average like 64% over 50% baseline? Why is 70% the best that you could do on any topic? It doesn't didn't make any sense to us in the, in, in the beginning, right? What so, was your gold standard to say what the correct answer was? Because you said people Oh, we use a major, right. majority class usually. On this particular thing, we had nine. It, it, this is one of the first mechanical thing, mechanical hit. Mechanical Turk hits that we'd ever done, and we we're influenced by this Snow et al. paper from Stanford that had looked at. It's called something like fast and cheap, but is it good? And they had shown that you know if you had nine annotators for a bunch of whole bunch of different tasks, that you know by the time you had nine, that was as good as having an expert or something like that. So that's what we did. We just put, we just said nine people, and then we took like you know five out of nine or six out of nine said it was on one side. And there aren't that many, I don't have the distribution in here anymore, but there aren't that many cases where people really are, where you get like a 50-50 thing between nine perkers, right? Most of the time that it goes one way or the other, it's pretty clear. I mean, there is sarcasm involved and it's hard to, huh? unless there is sarcasm. Yes, yeah, sarcasm, and I'm going to show you a particular case. So this is what's interesting that the, that the human top line pointed is to, rebuttals are, Things that are dialogically threaded on convince me, and the non rebuttals are more like monologic posts that stand alone, right? So, if if you um, this shows that on the human top line, the human is only getting 73% accuracy on on posts that come from a threaded conversation, whereas if they don't come from a threaded conversation, they're getting 87% accuracy. So, it, at like an initial post in a in a whole thread that's that just, you know, somebody's making their first argument, those posts are easy to cite, or ones where they're not directly rebutting something else, but this shows the effect of context, that the context is really important, and that without the context for a lot of these, you can't actually tell what side somebody's on, right? So humans are, you know, do poor, more par poorly at classifying rebuttals, and they also, like, when we have that split between ideological and non-ideological posts, they also, um, for the non-ideological posts, they can side them correctly 85% of the time, but for the ideological ones, only 76% of the time. So, so it's clear that context is having an effect, and this thing about ideological versus ideal, uh, non-ideological, it may simply reflect the fact that the ideological discussions are more deeply uh, nested. So this is a little example to kind of talk you through, like how you can use context better to understand these from an algorithm perspective. So, so say this is the post, and this is a um, this is a death penalty post. So it's, that's your evidence. What happened to those studies in the late '90s? A lot of things were different than the periods preceding and following the one you mentioned. We have no way to determine what of those contributed to a lower murder rate, if indeed there was one. You have to prove a cause and effect relationship, and you have failed. So, what side do you think that's on? For death penalty or against death penalty? Against. against. Yes. But it's not obvious, right? It's not real obvious. So, so if you look at the if you look at the parent post that it's being rebutted against um, for that, right? So this is a rebuttal link here. You just get a UR, you just get a URL, and we made this decision that we were not going to scrape and analyze URLs that were pointed to a single post. So that to us gives us really no information the way we're modeling it, right? But if we go if we go further back in the conversational thread. We find out that 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 um, this link between those two posts is that they're the same author, right? And that post is very clearly uh, pro-death penalty. This person is saying, if you kill people, then it you know it acts as a deterrent, and people can't go out and commit more crimes, and so it's really good to kill people, 
right? So when we have this whole network, it's very easy for us to um, finally um, conclude that this post is anti-death penalty. So we use a graph-based algorithm called MaxCut, which probably a lot of you use in your work regularly anyway. Um, but I'm still going to go through it for those that don't. So first, what we do is we use the reply structure to separate participants into two groups with the opposite stance. Then we use the text of the post, the, the out of the blue text, to uh, determine the stance of individual posts. And then we use the labels from step two to orient the partitions from step one. So even once you have a partition in a graph and you have a lot of posts on either side of it, you still have to decide which side is pro and which side is con, right? And um, so you build a big graph um, where you have like the different kinds of um, edges between nodes. So the nodes are the posts and the and the edges uh, represent whether it's the same author or if it's a rebuttal. And Max Cut tries to, um, so the, this is all said here probably better than I can say it off the top of my head. So the nodes represent the posts, the edges represent the relationships between the posts, and the edge weights can be positive or negative. So if it has a positive edge weight, it rewards the algorithm for cutting that edge because the algorithm is trying to maximize the um, weight of the edges that it cuts. And if it has a negative edge weight, it punishes the algorithm for cutting that edge and says, keep these things, try to keep these things together. And in, in the end, you know, when you, you know, you get all those weights and everything, then there's a, um, a kind of heuristic approximation of the procedure that will figure out uh, one cut on the graph. And this is an NP, um, NP complete algorithm, but there are tools out there that implement good approximations for it, which we used an off-the-shelf tool, but I think its name is something called Big Max Q or something like, like that. Yeah? Along these lines, have you tracked an individual's opinion on many topics such that, for example... If oh, you, like ideology? Well, if you take a user and look at many topics... There is opinions. a paper that does that. It's, um, it says, you know, the idea is like if you, if you're, um, if you believe in God, you might be uh, pro-death penalty, right. which actually is true. I mean, there's a statistical correlation between those things. So, so. Um, what I'm wondering is, could you reduce it down to if you ask someone's opinion on three topics? You, you could can predict all the others. Exactly. I don't. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, it's more like there's like 70%, 65% correlation that, you know, something like 65% of the people that believe in God are, you know, pro-death penalty or, right? So it's not, it's not absolute. Okay. And um, there's a paper from UT Dallas that is one of the first papers to kind of look at this ideology thing. And then we, I w did some work with Lisa Gator last year where we kind of did a joint model between stance and disagreement. And we tried to, in probabilistic soft logic, which is her, modeling framework, or graphical modeling framework, we tried to put ideology in there, and we didn't get any feedback from it, so we haven't returned to that again. If you have um, you have determined a stance of a topic and you are not sure because it's uh, ambiguous, can you also use relationship to other topics that you are for sure that, that people agree to some other people that has a definite stance on something else? And that we haven't. Um, so you say in terms of alignment between the Right, you, you don't know what this person is... Uh, we haven't done that. That's a good idea. Okay. So you say if they agree on abortion, they're probably going to agree on... If they are agreeing on different topics, maybe that can tell you in which way they are heading with that statement it's that you're It's a good sure. idea. Yeah. We haven't done that, yeah. Um, anyway, this part is just a supervised classifier, <coughs> so once you have a cut in the graph, you classify all the posts on either side of the cut, and then you use the margins, you sum up the margins, and you say, okay, I think this is, side is pro and this side is um, con. So just let me show you, am I half through yet? No, you're half through. Yeah, okay, well, I'm just running like two minutes behind. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, um, for the supervised classifier in this out of the blue, over, over the, um, you know, what you get by chance, it's really bad, right? So this is like without any context. I mean, you could say, oh, you guys are stupid, you don't have good features, maybe you could do 
better, you know, you should do more future engineering, but, you know, we put a whole lot of stuff in there, and, and it's not very good, and we tried a whole bunch of different learners, and we, we had a collaborator at Naval Coast Graduate School who did grid search for us for SVM, so we tried SVM with all these different parameters, and basically, we, it, in this out of the blue kind of context, we just didn't do very well. Um, but what's really interesting is that the max cut kind of applied in a, in a simple way, like I said, using an off-the-shelf uh, max cut tool, and not having a very good base classifier, when you bring in this contextual information, we've got these huge improvements overall, right? So, you know, for, uh, you know, for abortion, we went from 55%, say, to 82% accuracy on the, on the post level. And um, we do have, so we have some very, very good results, and we also have some that are bad, and those bad ones, you might have zeroed in on them, those bad ones are because we oriented the partitions, after we made the partitions, we oriented them the wrong way. And that shows that there's this very weak base classifier, it's just not very good. But overall, if we just take the weighted average of the accuracies according to the size of the you know, topic across all the posts, overall we get a, a, a um, increase of 14.2% overall, averaged over all the topics. So even when we have some part of the partitions are going the wrong way, we still get a very large overall improvement by using a graph algorithm to model. Did you have a question? You? Yeah. No? Okay. No, him back there. Um, okay, so now I'm going to move on to the second part. And like I said, this is, um, we've had a couple papers on, on this. This is the first time I put these things together in a talk. and so. Um, it's a little, you know, that's why I took an opportunity. I thought, oh, this is a really good chance, you know, to see what a bunch of smart people think about something that I'm really feeling, starting to feel good about. So um, give me your comments. I'd be really interested. So um, what we're doing here is we're trying to address this problem of what are the arguments that are pe people are making? And, um, and, you know, so kind of a causal relation, like why do they hold a particular <coughs> stance, and it could also be related to that thing of finding these people that stake out these middle positions by bringing in arguments that are normally associated with, with um, one side or the other, right? So there are on these websites that we've scraped, there, are, there is this idea of an argument facet, and an argument facet is a, is a, is a, is a, a type of argument, not a token, it's a type of an argument that is repeated all the time by different people in different contexts. That's what a facet is. So if you look at death penalty, for example, you, you see this thing said lots and lots of different ways in, with lots of different paraphrases <coughs> that the death penalty is a crime deterrent, right? You see things that say, you know, it, it prevents them from committing further crimes, it takes care of our prison crowding problem, um, it helps the victims' families achieve closure. So you, you see those same arguments repeated over and over again. And on some of these sites, these are the curated, curated by experts, somebody who wants to teach school children what the arguments are will we'll produce these kind of curated arguments and then people can kind of look at, look at them, right? And so here's some definitions for you. So our thought is that when people have different stances, you don't want to treat the you don't want to treat a whole post as kind of just one thing. There's lots of little arguments in there, and over the course of a dialogue, they might produce different arguments at different points in time. And so what you want to do is you want to figure out exactly what are the points of contention, what are the things that people are disagreeing about. And some of those things will be factual, right? Like, is the death penalty actually a deterrent, right? Is it really a deterrent? Um, so, um, so we call these things these kind of uh, tokens of repeated, these tokens of repeated arguments, we call those the central propositions or the central arguments. So those are at an individual dialogue level. The facets are the central propositions that kind of get repeated over a whole bunch of dialogues on a topic. And we've defined this new task, and I'll explain why in a minute, of argument facet similarity. So what it does is it aims to identify when two tokens, two, two paraphrases, of an argument are actually quite similar to each other and realize the same facet. So it's a it's a kind of paraphrase problem. And as I said, these <coughs> other sites, you know, one of the things that I want to point out, and I'm going to get to in a minute with the limitations, is that you know, so I debate, which is that site, has like five things on each side, 
right? It pulls out as being the kind of core arguments on either side. Uh, Procon.org has, has 10, top 10 pros and cons for the death penalty. Some of them are in overlap with the ones on iDebate. Some of them are slightly different. And their, their arguments, they have these detailed arguments for them that cite constitutional law and different kinds of things. So this is really kind of highly curated. And we discovered when we we're trying to use their facets on, to label our data, that in the middle, in a three month period, somebody completely reorganized the top 10 pros and cons on a particular topic. And the facets that we were using were suddenly changed and they weren't there on the site anymore. So that was very informative for us, which is was there's kind of no truth in this really, like what the important facets of an argument are. And that's partly what led to this idea that we have that, or made us think again, you know, that clearly the arguments for and against something change over time. So here's some examples of things that we think are similar facets. So here's an, here's an argument that gets made in the gun control. Guns just li are just like cars. They were invented to do what the owner wants to use them for, and there's no difference between a gun and a car. And then the other person rebuts that by saying, but guns are weapons, you know? <laughs> they are actually made to, for war, right, to kill. They're made to kill, right? You know, so there is a difference between a gun and a car. If you kill somebody with a car, it's an accident. You know, if you kill somebody with a gun, you know, it's probably not so much, you know, it could be an accident, but probably not so much an accident, right? And here's a different framing, kind of the same, of, of, the, of what we believe is the same facet, is to say, well, the U.S. clearly has a violence problem. There's too much violence in the United States. It has nothing to do with guns. You know, guns, guns are just tools. Guns are just tools, you know, that people have for different things. And it's got, no, you know, violence and murder and all those things, you know, they don't have anything to do with the prevalence of guns, right? So those are some arguments. We also get, this is, we get this stuff. I could tell you how many instances there are of this argument. You know, you can kill a person with your bare hands. You can kill a person with a baseball bat. A person can drown in an inch of water. You, you know, you can kill a, kill a person with a hat pin. You can, you know, I could tell you how many different instances of this, of this thing there is in our, in our data, right? So, so this is, you know, it kind of gets repeated all over the place. So in gay marriage, too, you know, you kind of obviously you're going to see the same thing. You know, there's this civil rights argument for gay marriage. There's like a religious argument often against it. There's a civil rights argument for it. And this thing, you know, my, my family, um, you know, if her religion gets made into law, it bars my family from the legal protection. It's a civil rights issue. You know, gay marriage is a civil rights issue, right? And you see the same argument again. It's the civil benefits that are at issue. We're not looking for religion. We're looking for civil legal benefits. And then you get this whole list of all the benefits that are automatically accorded to people that are married that you know, would automatically go to gay couples if they were allowed to marry as well, right? So anyway, so those are the kinds of things. And we frame this as um, consisting of three steps in order to try to find these arguments and group them <coughs> into facets. And I'm going to explain why we want to do it in a bottom-up way. So, um, so the idea is first is that we want to go into the post and we want to find the phrases that clearly, clearly state an argument. Um, and then, once we found a whole bunch of those things, then we, wanted, we want to group them by how similar they are to other instances. So we have a metric for argument facet similarity that we want to apply. And once we have a good similarity metric, we should be able to um, group arguments into facets. And then, even though we don't have a label, we could use like a central <laughs> centroid of that cluster as the label for the thing, right? That's, that's kind of the idea. So the, the first step, the argument extraction steps, um, step, is to find and extract the central propositions from a large corpus of topic-sorted dialogues. And we've tried three different ways to do this. So the first idea was, um, if you give dialogues to a human and you tell them, give me a summary of 100 words or less of this dialogue, any native speaker of the language or somebody with language competence will actually pick out the things that are at issue. They'll just zero in on them, and they don't have to have any training. They'll just go in and find them. And so we wanted to, we wanted the task to be framed in such a way that we could put on mechanical turf. We have we have a set of qualified turkers now that do dialogue summaries for us, and we think that those summaries are pretty high quality. Yes. Can facets have subfacets, or are they atomic? They they could. 
um, they could have subfacets, and that's part of the reason why we're trying to model it as this not categorical thing. I think that's on the, where is that? Somehow my related work slide is missing. Oh, I know where it is. It's in with the argument facet part. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, okay. Um, well, I could go ahead and I, see. Most of the previous work treated it as a supervised learning approach where there were these labels like from iDebate or the annotators kind of got together and agreed what the facets were and then they all labeled the data. And that treats the facet as being categorical, as atomic is your word. And... Um, but we don't believe it's categorical. We think that there's these relationships between facets, and facets can be an overlap. And so the idea of similarity is, you know, textual similarity or argument facet similarity. We believe it captures the nature of the data in, in, a, in a much better way than this kind of categorical notion. Okay, so, um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so human summarization, that's what I do. We have a corpus of human summaries. Um, and we have one paper where we use the summaries to try to see what kind of facets came out of the human summaries. When we have a paper at SIGDAL from last year where the idea was, we thought that, you know, we have all these argumentative discourse cues in our data. And we thought that they're kind of implicit markup by the participant. Like if I say because, you know, because I said so, right, or or because it's not a deterrent or whatever, you know, that I thought the idea was that these kind of causal markers that mark the reasoning would mark, you know, that their dependent, their dependent clause would, um, would, would be a, 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 an argument. And that kind of worked, but not very well. And so then we have this sentence selection approach that I'm gonna, that we've just got these results for like two weeks ago, where we, I, I kind of, I'm characterizing it as brute force, that where we just, we just keep developing features and figure out like what we're getting, why we're getting stuff we don't want, and and then you know kind of. So I'll show you. So we've we've tried these three different approaches, and here's kind of what the summaries look like of that. You know, so this is one of those um, dialogue part. You know, the segment that I showed you about gay marriage um, is part of the dialogue that this summary is about. These two summaries. Right, so people do, you know, they do say other stuff. The thing about the human summaries is they kind of pick out, they do pick out like what the important facets are, but they also, <coughs> the thing about the human summaries is that they're, um, they use context and so you can't interpret them directly. Um, and they, um, sometimes some people are longer, some people are shorter, so we've experimented with saying like, make it 50 words, make it 100 words, make it 150 words. But anyway, we have, we have these summaries and we've done um, this pyramid approach with them, which is an idea from information retrieval. Who's familiar with this? It's like track evaluation for summary production. Okay, well the idea with this is that you have N summaries, N summaries, and you, um, you look across the N summaries and you have an annotator actually produce the kind of like a facet label, right? Like a facet label is that you know, gay couples are interested in the rights and benefits associated with marriage. So these SCU labels are produced by a human annotator, and then they look at all the summaries across the dialogue, and they say, with this tool, was that, um, was that facet used in that summary, right? So then you get this idea of a tier, which is like how important that content is to, in, the, in the summary. And it was used, it was used in TREC, um, it's developed at Columbia, it's used in TREC to do um, evaluation of, of summaries, machine-produced summaries. And so we're applying it here to these human summaries, and we're using the tiers to tell us like which of the things that are in a summary are the ones that are repeated across different summarizers that seem to be more important in the, in the dialogue. And so these dialogues, uh, these summaries, we have them available. So this, this sentence selection model is the stuff that we've been working on over the summer and fall. Um, so we had this model from SIGDAL <coughs> that was supposed to do sentence selection, argument extraction. And it kind of worked, but it was still, there was a lot of noise in the data that we were getting. Um, certainly it wasn't good enough to like use for the next phase without human refinement. So we, what we did is we took the, that model that we had and we applied it to predict um, argument quality. 
And then we took all the stuff that was kind of in the top part of the distribution, everything that was above 0.55, and, and we, we didn't go higher because we were worried, we were worried that we would reduce our recall. That we would, if we, for example, only took stuff that was 0.85 and above, we would just get the same arguments over and over again that were repeated, that were the most frequent, and we would miss out on arguments that were more unusual and represented more like the whole breadth of the argumentation. So we went, we went down to 0.55, we binned them into five bins, and then we did a task to evaluate our, we, we applied more filters. So this one I say is kind of brute force, really. We kept saying, oh, we're not getting what we want, we're not getting what we want, you know, you know we're getting stuff that doesn't have a verb, we're getting stuff that has too many non-English words, we're getting, you know, and so we, we kind of refined it. And then we did a mechanical Turk task where just a binary task of, does this sentence express an argument? a clearly defined argument or not. And I'm pretty happy with these results that we finally got. Um, so these are like some examples of things that we're pulling out on the, on the gun control debate. If gun bans work, there'd be no gun deaths in the countries that agree on guns. Gun haters will just do anything, you know, to take away our constitutional rights. Um, right, so we get, you know, we, we, we get a lot of the stuff that we expect to get for gun control, which is something we actually know quite a lot about now because we've got like 37,000 posts and we've been, we've been working on it. And this is, the, this is what happens, you know, so the, the prediction, our previous prediction score, you know, was kind of, wasn't very good. Those are the bins. This, this bin range is from the SIGDAL model. Um, and then you see that though that, you know, we're starting to get a lot of, um, actually I said that wrong, this is the new bin range, right? So we're, we're starting to get a lot of stuff that is, um, is better, right? So we decided, well, now we can go ahead. We have, we have something we still don't know. We don't really know. We haven't tried to quantify what the recall is. Like, are we missing out arguments that are less frequent that people aren't making? We, we haven't tried to quantify that yet. Yeah? yeah? Did you always start with topics, or did you also detect topics that people have? Made no, we've started with topics here. I, I think a lot of times you could get rough topic groupings, actually scrape them off the sites, because people have to put things under, um, like this is a social topic, and also topic classification is more, I mean, a lot of people think it's unsupervised class, topic classification is a, is a solved problem. I'm not sure I completely agree, but, but um, I'm not going to work on it. So, so. Um, what yes? is SIGDIAL special interest group on what? Sorry. What, what is SIGDIAL special? Oh, interest special group interest on? group on discourse and dialogue. So it's people oh. interested in language and context. Okay, good. It's a it's a sub SIG of the Associate of Competition Linguistics. So dial is dialogue. Yeah, it's single. You know, like ACL. I don't know if you went to ACL 20 years ago or whatever, but it used to be. You know single thread and everybody was there for every session and everybody heard all the papers on all the topics and it's obviously it's nothing like that anymore you know it was what a four parallel sessions and a poster session going all the time and everything like that but sig dial is still like single session and so it's kind of a nice little venue if you really want to look at like language and context okay so we i feel pretty good about this and we've applied it to four or five different topics now and we're um so so now we're going to move to the now we're kind of moving to yeah 10 minutes okay so now we now we have those arguments and we're trying to figure out which one should be kind of grouped together and said that they're part of the same facet so i already got to say this earlier because ron asked me um this question so i already said that earlier um that that this is primarily what other people have done. This is supervised learning that's categorical, and they put these labels on it. We don't like it, right? We don't like it for a whole bunch of reasons. It's specific to the existing data and the topic at the time. If you see unusual arguments, they just get thrown into a bin. If they don't fit in the labeling that you have, the professionally curated arguments that are sometimes used for labels might not capture what people are saying. Like, I don't think you're going to find on one of those professionally curated sites the argument that you can kill somebody with a hat pin. Um, the arguments are sometimes related. They're not categorical. I and mean, then I believe, although I haven't shown it, that new arguments kind of arise over time and there's new things. Like, imagine that 
the argument that death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. Just imagine it had never been made, right? And then you have those botched executions in Oklahoma, and all of a sudden that argument's everywhere. Everybody's saying. So, so, so either the frequency of a particular argument will change over time as events happen in the public sphere, or actually I believe new arguments will come up. So probably, you know, 30 years ago, the argument that we should have a wall between us and Mexico, that argument, maybe nobody had made that argument yet. Oh, you know, they might have said that, you know, we don't want to let Mexicans in because they're bringing cholera into the country, but nobody had this great idea that we could build, you know, a 30-foot wall and that would solve all the problems, right? So we do believe that there are, you know, these new arguments coming in all the time, and even if you think they're irrational, you think they're crazy, or, or you, they would never occur on a professionally curated site, you want to know what people are saying, right? What are people actually saying? What do they actually believe? So, so anyway, we, we feel like our, this approach, this kind of unsupervised bottom-up induction approach is a better, better fit to the problem. And it's kind of like paraphrased detection or learning, and it's also quite similar to this semantic textual similarity task that they've been doing in the semi vowel workshops over the last few years. Um, which says the degree to which two phrases or sentences mean the same thing. So our, our argument facet similarity task is different than, but kind of inspired by this semantic textual similarity task. And you know, we collected judgments for argument facet similarity on a scale on mechanical turf. Um, we, we've done it on both the human summaries and on our sentence extraction cases. This is our uh, MACL paper from last year. We use this. Um, Semantic textual similarity baseline from University of Maryland, um, which won the semi the 2013 semival contest, and they have it out. They have it on the web. They obviously they restrict you to so many queries. So when we want to get their baseline, sometimes it takes us a couple weeks um, for this. You know, to get it for this task because they don't they don't give you the software. You just have to keep like pinging their website. But anyway, we, we got results. We got an R of 0.54, which was significantly better than that baseline. And we tried a bunch of different features. And, we, and um, so that was one result that we got. That was with the um, human summaries. And then um, this is, I'm going to skip over this, because this is just a bunch of examples of how um, <coughs> argument facet similarity ranges over different kinds of pairs of arguments. And we can go back to that in the questions if anybody wants to see. Um, so this is the stuff from our sentence selection, which as I said, we just finished running a couple weeks ago. So we take, we have the sentence selection arguments and we take them all and we have some, we have some training data saying how similar you know, are these two arguments. But all the features that we use, we believe are topic independent. So we have, you know, like a corpus of topic sorted dialogues and we get the PMI of certain engrams and then we, you know, we have a, we have a feature that's, you know, uh, PMI weighted engrams. And so we, we believe, although I haven't, I don't have any results here showing it, we believe that, you know, the, the way we're doing this is topic independent. Um, and so you have, you know, you have a pair of things and there's the me mechanical turf prediction and, the, and our, our trained argument facet similarity predictor. And um, right now, we've got um, our best R is 0.66 with our RMS of 0.78. And Rouge is our, interestingly, our best competitor on that. It beats out, because Rouge is a translation um, <coughs> metric, it beats out um, the semantic textual similarity thing. Our task is it's different. And their data, that's, the data that's been used for this semantic textual similarity task is so much easier than our data. The sentences are shorter, the vocabulary is more restricted, you know, it's, it, it's, um, it's not surprising that their thing doesn't do that well on it, but that, that particular system, it has everything in it that you could ever possibly imagine as, a, as like a technical approach. It's got alignment, it's got, you know, distributionally similar words, it's got all this other stuff, but it's not trained on our data. And we have a, probably a lot of the same underlying features in our, in our model. And, and anyway, so that's our best result as of like five days ago. So <laughs> is a task to predict the similarity yeah. based on um, features you define? Yeah, based on, so we take these things, we have a bunch of features, 
you know, like PMI and gram overlap, distributionally similar words, uh, probably we have sense length in there, we have, um, I, I can't even remember, I mean we have a bunch of stuff in there like, you know, kitchen sink. And then we have some training data that predicts argument facet similarity. It doesn't use any um, topic-specific features. The SIGDAO paper that we've already published compares topic-specific, it has some topic-specific features in it and compares the, what you get for topic-specific features versus ones that aren't topic-specific. But this is all with, there aren't any topic-specific features in here. They're all meant to be general across topic. Yes? So speaking of that, do you use any deep parsing like features? Oh, we have word to vec. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the SIGDAO paper, it didn't help, but I think in this, um, it's in there, in the proposed model, and I think, I can't say for sure, but I think that Amita told me that it's, it's helping now, and I'm not sure why it didn't help before with the, in the previous studies. Maybe we didn't have enough data. Or, I don't know. It could have been that the word to back that Reed used was trained on the wrong corpus, or I, I don't know. But anyway, it's helping now. Can you talk a little bit about the second one there, or third one, Luke? Oh, Luke is an off the shelf set, uh, dictionary that's developed by James Pennebaker, who's a psychologist at UT. And it's, it has uh, different word categories. So it has words like, it has categories of words like cognitive mechanism negative emotion, positive emotion. Um, it's, it's really, it's quite a common tool. You and use the categories, loop categories? And we take, actually, yeah, we could use their tool, but we don't. We buy a copy of their tool every time a new version comes out. And then we use the dictionary in our own tool. So, um, it's it it's it's ama it's an amazingly hard baseline to beat for a lot of these sentiment tasks that we do. It captures a lot of stuff, and we have um, we have code to develop loop generalized dependencies. So you could say like this is a negative emotion word, and you could leave some part of it lexical lexicalized, and leaves and have some part of it generalized. So you could say this is a negative emotion word, but its target is you know a family member. Right, or this is a positive emotion word, and its target is a category of sports events, or you know those those kinds of generalizations you could make across a whole bunch of data. It's, it's quite useful. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the motivation of predicting the similarity? You know, I can always to represent <coughs> the original argument in certain uh, maybe more complicated. Um, representation and calculate their similarity using, for example, some uh, defined distance. And here, uh, you're trying to predict the similarity based on the features. Mm -hmm. why, why, you want to why do we want to do that? Yeah. So that we can do this facet induction. So we, But we don't think that the facets are categorical, so we want a scalar thing where you could do kind of like hierarchical agglomerative clustering and you can say that these are like little sub facets and that this is a super facet of that and kind of group things together. We also think you could have an interface where you could say like here's an argument, find me some similar arguments, right? And it would be